Hello, this is Professor Keen, and welcome back to Introduction to Astronomy, where we are looking at Aristotle's book on the heavens. In this particular section that we are looking at, Aristotle is addressing the question of what is the shape of the Earth, what is its location, and is it in motion? Aristotle, as we mentioned in the last lecture, believes that the Earth is sitting at rest in the center of the universe. But why? Why is the Earth at rest? After all, if you pick up a piece of Earth, a small piece of Earth, like a rock, and release it, it will undergo motion. It will fall down. So why is it that the Earth does not fall down itself? Why is it at rest? What's holding it in its place? This problem seems to have arisen for many philosophers in the ancient Greek world, and in this chapter, which is on page 32 in his student's guide through the great physics texts, Aristotle recounts some of the ideas that attempted to solve this problem, that is, solve why it is that the earth is at rest. We talked about in the last lecture how Xenophanes of Colon believed that the earth pushes its roots down to infinity. That is, if you dig down, you'll get earth as far as you go. That is, there's earth below earth, below earth, below earth, and it never ends. Notice how this avoids the entire question of what holds the earth up, because you don't need to answer it if it's earth all the way down. Aristotle is unhappy with this explanation. He thinks it's a logical fallacy, and I'll come back to this in a moment. Another example of an explanation that Aristotle disagrees with is the opinion of Thales of Miletus. Thales of Miletus said that the earth floats on water. Aristotle says this is the oldest preserved theory. Remember, we're talking about the 4th century BC in which Aristotle was writing, so Thales of Miletus must have lived significantly before Aristotle. Aristotle rejects the idea of Thales of Miletus because he says uh, that it doesn't push the argument far enough. After all, if earth is floating on water and water is holding it up, well, what's holding the water up? Now, there might be something holding the water up, but simply postulating that water holds it up doesn't really solve the problem. It just pushes the problem back one level. So this is perhaps a good time to talk about causal series and what counts as an explanation in Aristotle's mind. So let me digress for a moment and talk about causal explanations. And Aristotle would say that there are two kinds of series of causal explanations. So one of the kinds of series of causal explanations is called an accidentally ordered series. You'll see, and I'll explain what I mean by that in a moment. Accidentally ordered series of causes. And the other one would be an essentially ordered or ordered per se, so essentially ordered series of causes. What's the difference between these? Well, let me give you an example of each, and then you'll perhaps see what, what, the, what the difference is between these. So let's suppose you have a person, I'll say you have a man, and this man has the power to give rise to another man, so the next generation, okay? The man can give, um, can give rise to a son. And that son, by virtue of being a human being, also has the power to give rise to another son. Of course, a woman must be involved. That son has the power to give rise to another son. So if you want to ask, you know, where did Jason come from? You said, well, Jason, he is the son of Eric. And who is Eric? Well, he's the son of Abraham. And Abraham, he's, a, who's a, he's the son of, well, maybe Jimmy, okay? Now, each of these can be explained as being caused by the father and his father and his father. But notice that the cause does not is not necessarily sustained through generations. What I mean by that is once the great-great-great-grandfather dies, it doesn't prevent this son from existing. His existence at this moment doesn't depend essentially on the existence of his great-great-grandfather, right? So this is what Aristotle would call an accidentally ordered series of causes. And these kinds of things, um, you, you don't need to have the first element in order to explain the current existence of the last element. So you do not 
need the first um, cause in order to explain the persistence of later causes. Now, of course, for this one to arise, he had to have had a great-great-grandfather, but his existence right here and now doesn't depend on the existence of his great-grandfather. That is very different than an essentially ordered series of causes. So in this one, the first element, or the first cause, is necessary here and now. in order to explain what is going on, so the last element, or the last um, member of the series. So if you got rid of the first cause, or the first element, it, you don't have an explanation of why things are the way they are right here and right now. So an example of this would be if you have a block that is um, on a shelf. And I would say, this shelf is holding this block up. And you say, oh yeah, well what's holding the shelf up? Well, that's attached to a wall, okay? So the wall is holding up, the wall is holding up that shelf. Well, what's holding the wall up? Well, the wall is sitting on the ground, right? Now notice that um, if you get rid of the ground and you don't explain there is a ground, then the entire thing falls apart you need to have the ground there in order to support the wall, you need to have the wall there in order to support the shelf, you need the shelf there to support the block right here and now. So if you get rid of an earlier element of the series, then the present persistence of the thing that you're trying to explain doesn't really have an explanation. This is exactly the kind of criticism that Aristotle has for some of the kind of arguments like those of Xenophanes and Thales. So Xenophanes will not really give an explanation for why the earth is at rest. He just says there's earth all the way down, but then you have an infinite series of causes without an explanation for the entire thing. And Thales really just cuts this off too early. He says, well, Thales says that the earth is floating on water, but he doesn't explain why the water is floating, right? So Aristotle sees a problem with their kind of causal explanations. Aristotle believes that there must be a first cause or an uncaused cause. Aristotle claims that in order to explain the here and now, to explain what is going on here and now, here and now, an example of that is the rest of the earth. In order to understand what's going on here and now, one must appeal eventually to a final cause. Even, the, even if we don't know what that is right now, we know there must be a final uncaused cause. That is one that does not require an explanation in and of itself. So this has interesting implications. This is something that will later on be taken up by some Islamic philosophers to explain that there must be a primary uncaused cause. We'll call that God. This is something that Thomas Aquinas picks up for apologetic purposes in explaining the Christian God. Okay, so that's just a nice, um, nice point. It's, I know it's a digression a bit from what Aristotle is directly talking about, but these are the ideas that he's thinking about when he criticizes Xenophanes and Thales. Let's look at the bottom of page 32, looking back at the text. So he mentions some other thinkers like Anaximenes and Anaxagoras and Democritus. Democritus, you might remember that name. He is the father of atomism. He believed that around us, everything we see is comprised of atoms and they're moving through a void. Aristotle, by the way, was an opponent of this position. Anyway, Anaximenes, Anaxagoras, and Democritus believed that the earth was flat and that the flat earth accounts for the fact that it's still. It's hard to explain exactly where the, um, how they believe this, but it seems to be that they believe that a flat earth could cover air, and air could hold it up. A bit like, suppose if you have um, a jar full of air, and you fit a nice 
tight plate over the top um, or that can slide in and out of it. Maybe I'll try to draw a picture. Let's suppose you have a piston like this and it's hollow but it has a bottom to it and it's full of air and if you put um, a I'll draw like this and if you put a plate in it that just fits into it it can kind of float there if it's a nice seal on the edges it can float because the air underneath it will be compressed and that compressed air is capable of supporting it and that's the way that at least according to Aristotle Anaximenes, Anaxagoras, and Democritus are thinking. They say the flatness of the earth accounts for its stillness because flat bodies cover lids of air which can support them, and that's what's happening with the earth. Aristotle says, okay, well, I mean, it is true that compressed air can support things, but the important thing that's supporting it in that case is really just that whatever is floating has to be able, has to be big enough to plug the hole. So you could have according to Aristotle, you could have a, a ball inside of here as well, as long as it's big and heavy enough that it could plug this hole, that ball would be supported by the air underneath it too. So at the very least, he says, their proof doesn't explain, it, their proof doesn't rely on the shape of the earth in order for it to float, because after all, you could have a ball floating on top of earth as well. On the next page, what does Aristotle do? He says one must decide at the outset, and this is where we're getting his perspective more. He's been criticizing other thinkers, but he says one must decide at the outset if bodies have a natural motion or only a constrained motion. And natural motion means a motion that is in an internal power of that thing, or if all motion is simply constrained, that is forced to do what it's doing somehow from the outside. So there's kind of a question of whether things have powers in themselves or if they are inert or dead and only are acted on from the outside. And since we assume, he says, that bodies have the power to move due to their essential nature, that is what informs our thinking. And on the other hand, other people, like um, I think he mentions in this paragraph uh, Empedocles, um, other people think that the Earth is at the center of the universe because of constraint forces from the outside, specifically a whirl, a whirling motion um, that's keeping it where it is. Now, how are we to understand this? Uh, he says that according to Empedocles, for example, the heavens are whirling around and that is pushing the Earth to the center of the world. You might think about if you have like a cup of tea with some little tea leaves floating on top of it. If you get this spinning around so that the tea is spinning, what happens to the tea leaves that are floating on top? You'll notice that they collect at the center of the cup while they're spinning. Well, that's his picture of why the earth, why, that's Empedocles picture of why the earth is at the center of the world because the heavens themselves are whirling around as Aristotle would agree but that whirling of the heavens is forcing the earth to be at the center. In other words, the position of the earth is constrained from the outside to be where it is. It's the heavens that are spinning that make the earth be at the center. This is opposed to Aristotle's explanation for why the earth is at the center, and he says it's because earth has a natural tendency to be at the center. It is not forced there by anything from outside. It's an internal principle of earth to be at the center. How does he criticize Empedocles' idea? Well, if it is the whirl that's causing the earth to accumulate at the center, there's nothing unique about earth that would accumulate that at the center. After all, why would, why would not fire accumulate at the center? Or why would not water accumulate at the center? The explanation that Empedocles seems to offer doesn't account uniquely for why Earth should be constrained to be at the center as opposed to other elements. On the other hand, Aristotle's idea that things have their natural place, a natural tendency that arises from their in some internal principle to them, explains why the Earth is at the center, the water also tends to be at the center, but not as strongly as the Earth, and the fire and the, and the air tend to rise. Okay? Um, 
He also goes on to talk about Anaximander. So let me say one other thing about Anaximander. Uh, Anaximander has an interesting idea. He says that the Earth is at the center. So he agrees with Aristotle, the Earth is at the center. But the explanation for that is the indifference theory. This is explained on page 34 by Aristotle. He said the Earth is at the center due to indifference. That is, it feels kind of an attraction to the different parts of the circumference, that is the distant stars, but if all of those attractions are equal, it's pulled in equal directions with equal forces, then it really can't decide which way to go, and that is why it stays at the center. It's a bit like an explanation, and Aristotle mentions this as well, that Zeno gives, one of Zeno's famous paradoxes. He's an ancient Greek thinker as well. Zeno gives an example. This isn't exactly the example, but I think you'll get the idea. Let's suppose that you are hungry. You want to get a sandwich, and there are two refrigerators in the room. One is on the right side of the room, and one is on the left side of the room. They have equally good sandwiches in them. They're equally distant from you, and you want to go toward the right sandwich and the left sandwich. But if you want them exactly equally, then you will not be able to decide which one to go to, and those equal pulls in opposite directions will basically cause you to star starve to death because you have no preference of one over the other. That's the kind of explanation that Anaximander seems to be giving for why the Earth stays at the center, because of this indifference or inability to decide which way to go. Aristotle claims that this is an ingenious idea, but unsatisfactory. Why? Because once again, it, it does not explain why uniquely Earth is at the center. After all, if one were to put fire or water right at the center, they would also remain in the same place for the exact reason that Anaximander gives. So it doesn't really explain how Earth got to be at the center in the first place, as opposed to fire or water or Earth. Only, Aristotle claims, can natural powers or tendencies explain why the earth is at the center. Let's stop there. Next time we will talk about chapter 14.